that starting? Why is that not starting? Oh, yes, we are, we are recording. Uh, right, uh, so it's lovely to see everybody. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we, we kick off straight away with Matt's talk, and then we can pick up some of the other issues that we've been discussing in previous forums and, and sort of do any, any other issues that people want to discuss um, after we've heard the talk. Um, so I'm delighted that, that Matt O'Connor from the Brompton has been able to join us. And I believe you're gonna talk about CRT. Is that correct, Matt? Um, or ICD yeah. or C, um, devices in general? Uh, so, so CRT and what's what's new about CRT, I suppose, as well. Great, thanks. I think that's that was that was definitely what was requested last time. So, thank you very much for joining us, and um, I'll I'll hand over to to you straight away. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Um, before I start, I'll, I'll just share my screen so you can see some pictures and presentations and stuff. Um, but before I start, is there anyone who has any specific questions they want uh, addressed about CRT? Because um, we might as well get them out there to begin with, and then we can address them along the way as it as it comes. My presentation will stay where it's supposed to. Apologies, I'm busy fighting with this. Give me two seconds. I'm going to take it that's a no on specific questions. Everyone's clearly just hoping that you're going to say something controversial. Oh, I'll probably say lots of controversial things. Um, so, OK, in, in which case I'll, I'll talk about CRT with a sort of working on a general overview of CRT, what the, the traditional way up until a couple of years ago, what CRT has really involved. Um, and then highlight a few of the limitations of, of the traditional CRT and then what the and talk a little bit about what the new kid on the block is, so to speak. Um, we're doing quite a bit of it here now um, because to, to my mind, at least there's quite a lot of advantages of, of the new way of approaching things. Um, and I'm specifically not giving it a name yet just so I don't give all the game away until a little bit later on. Um, if anybody does have questions, just just jump in uh, and and shout out halfway through. The, the sort of less formal and more interactive is always easier, I suppose. Um, so we'll start off with the the outline is generally just to say what is CRT, why do we give CRT people what's what's the indication, um, how good uh, is is CRT, and then the alternatives. And this is where the hiss and left bundle pacemakers come into the equation and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for, for some questions at the end. So indications for CRT uh, I have in my mind as a, as a sort of a little escalating scale. The, the strongest indication is, is heart failure um, and that's people who have electrical mechanical dysynchrony, uh, particularly of the left ventricle. Um, the, the official numbers, if you like, is an ejection fraction less than 35% um, with a left bundle branch block. There are variations on that and how strong the indication is for CRT, uh, and we'll go through those in a little bit. But if you have in your mind that the strongest and most useful area where CRT helps is in heart failure patients. Um, and it, it does two things. It has an acute improvement. So if you have a dysfunction, uh, sorry, dyssynchronous ventricle, generally your septum contracts before your lateral wall. Uh, and that means that the heart, rather than uh, contracting with both walls against each other, sort of just wobbles from side to side, um, which has uh, a far worse cardiac output. So there's an acute benefit to uh, the electrical and subsequent mechanical resynchronization that CRT gives. 
over time, there's also a reverse remodeling that, that's yeah, sort of a very that complex uh, cellular process that happens over a period of many months that is the, the benefit we see with an improved ejection fraction um, over time, which is why once we put in CRT, we usually wait at least three, if not six months or, or sometimes longer before we reassess LV function to see if, if we've made a difference to that. It's probably worth noting though that, that some people will get significant symptomatic benefit even if they don't get an improvement in their ejection fraction and vice versa. So, so both is possible. Usually they come together, um, but it is possible to have one and not the other. So essentially you can have the chronic benefit without the acute benefit or vice versa. The next strongest indication to my mind is, is a pacing cardiomyopathy treatment. Um, which is just sort of a, a, a cardiologist induced heart failure, really. And uh, we'll have a little talk about pacing cardiomyopathy in a second. And, and finally, the sort of the softest indication to my mind is, is preventing pacing cardiomyopathy. Um, so essentially, someone who's got a normal or near normal ventricle um, who for some reason is getting a device anyway. So whether they need a, a standard pacemaker because they're, they're bradycardic or they're getting an ICD, you can uh, right off the outset implant a CRT thinking, well, look, if these people are likely to develop a cardiomyopathy, we're going to prevent that by putting CRT in straight away. Um, the, I'll actually skip forward to the pacing induced cardiomyopathy. pacing dependent um, is, is your typical person. And this is just a, a big list of trials of, of pacemakers that have looked at LV function dropping off over time with pacing burden. Um, it, it's probably around about 20% of people who have uh, pacemakers with a moderate pacing burden. So if someone's paced in the ventricle 30, 40 percent of the time plus, then they're at risk of a pacing cardiomyopathy. There's a variation. So although 20 percent of people will have some LV dysfunction, it's probably only five, maybe 10 percent at most that have significant severe LV dysfunction. But having said that, still quite a large portion of the of the population. And this is entirely treatable. So if somebody develops a pacing cardiomyopathy from RV pacing, you upgrade them to CRT and almost inevitably their LV function will return to normal within a couple of months. Uh, it's also very preventable as well by putting in a CRT in the first place. Uh, essentially what you're doing is correcting the induced dyssynchrony by pacing from one particular spot in the, in the right ventricle. Um, indications in general that this is stolen from the, the European guidelines um, where there's a lot of words, but essentially what it says is that there are indications for CRT that are uh, stronger, i.e. people are going to be highly likely to get a good benefit from, from CRT. And then down at the bottom end, you've got people far less likely to benefit from CRT. And I really like this um, sort of upside down triangle diagram. And I have it in my mind every time I see someone who we're thinking about CRT. So that the people who make me the happiest are people with really broad QRSs, so 200 and something milliseconds, big left bundle branch block. So you're saying all the synchrony is in the left ventricle, which is the thing that you're going to be addressing. Uh, females tend to do better with CRT than males uh, and people with a non ischemic cardiomyopathy. And that's probably because ischemic cardiomyopathy has more scar and it doesn't matter what you do with clever pacing things, scar is dead heart tissue, you can't resurrect it. So you can't resynchronize a dead bit of heart. Uh, then right down at the bottom, you've got people with narrower QRSs. So there's less dyssynchrony to fix and people who don't have left bundle branch block because you're only resynchronizing the left ventricle by CRT. 
or traditional CRT, should I say. Um, so this, this is uh, my little way of thinking about what we're doing with CRT. Um, so it will start off by looking at this diagram on the left hand side here. So this is us staring down the apex of the heart, left ventricle here, right ventricle sort of wrapped around on the outside. Um, so the idea of CRT is to pace from two opposite sides of the left ventricle to try and maximize the amount of resynchronization. If you put a pacing lead just here and a pacing lead just here, all you're doing is resynchronizing these two parts. And you're leaving out all this uh, part of the ventricle here. So generally the approach I have, which is roughly what most people do, is to stick your right ventricular lead somewhere in the septum, which is roughly in the middle. It doesn't really matter whether you're up here or down here, but somewhere over here. And then clearly what you want to be doing is trying to put a lead directly opposite, so right out over here. And that's where the coronary venous system comes into things. Now you might this is a fluoroscopic image with some contrast injected into the heart at various places in exactly the same projection as this diagram here. So here you've got an atrial lead going up there. We can ignore that. It's not very interesting. And there's a ventricular lead coming down here. You can see a big thick part of it is, is the coil as part of a defibrillator component. And it's scooting off down to the bottom. So it's sitting about here in the right ventricle. What's happened then is, is there's a little sheath coming down here that's snuck in with a balloon here to the coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus is the way that all of the blood is drained from the ventricular myocardium. And in essence, you can kind of think about it as the venous version of the coronary arterial system. And it pretty much tracks alongside the coronary arteries. So it means you've got access to coronary veins from the coronary sinus that then run down the ventricle from the base to the apex as you're going around from posterior, posterior lateral, lateral and so on, anterior. And then this one that comes right anterior and goes down to the apex runs just next door to the LED the coronary artery there. So same, same anatomy. What you're looking to do with CRT is to utilize this venous system, which drains directly into the right atrium, to pass a lead down here and down one of these little branches that's sitting off in this sort of lateral aspect, so that you end up with a lead which is actually epicardial. So it's on the outside of the heart over here somewhere. Uh, and then you have your other lead here, so your left ventricle is depolarized stimulated from two exact opposite ends, giving you nice resynchronization. Same picture on the left. This picture on the right is just looking at it in the other direction. So you've got the base of the heart up here. And you're staring at the right ventricle or the left ventricle, if you like, from the side. Apex of the heart is down here. And we divide it into basal. So the coronary sinus coming around here. Coronary sinus runs runs around the, the mitriannulus, so it's sort of right at the division of the left atrium up here, the left ventricle here. And you can see here these branches coming off the coronary sinus, running down the ventricle here and here. Now, the, the ideal place to put your left ventricular lead is somewhere in the mid ventricle, so you don't want it right down at the apex. Is you just going to be pacing quite close to each other between the two leads. And if you put it really basally, it's probably just going to fall out because it hasn't got wedged into these little veins. So trying to pace from somewhere in the middle is really good. But, and I only say this because it's good to have a concept of roughly where these leads should be and what you're trying to achieve. Because one of the limitations of CRT is that these veins aren't always where you want them to be. Um, so sometimes there's no useful veins over here. There are other problems with these veins and you just can't put the lead where you want to get it.
Uh, and that comes to the topic of the efficacy of CRT, which is roughly a third of people will not respond. They won't get any benefit at all from CRT, uh, which is a bit disappointing because it's uh, it's a procedure you're putting people through often that they'd have no other device if it weren't for this. Um, and there's risks associated with it, small but not insignificant. Those who don't respond, um, you can try and optimize the lead position. Uh, so sort of those few factors we were talking about before. And you can change the programming of the device to make some difference. Um, often it only makes very minor differences. Uh, it doesn't usually change someone from a non-responder to a super responder, but it might improve things very slightly. Some of the limitations of, of traditional CRT is if somebody has right bundle branch block, if you put CRT in, you're doing nothing to the right ventricle. So you have to try to find out if there is left ventricular dyssynchrony as well. So the, the strength of the indication for implantation of CRT in someone with right bundle branch block is quite weak. Um, and, and it can make people feel worse rather than better. Um, SCAR, as we mentioned before, you can't pace SCAR. So if someone's had a large myocardial infarction on the lateral wall where you're trying to pace to get your beautiful uh, CRT location with your leads, but it's all dead on the side. You're not going to achieve anything at all. You're not going to be able to capture and pace the heart from there. Phrenic nerve capture is another real downfall of, of these left ventricular leads. Uh, so this is this is somebody's chest being open, so you're staring at it from essentially the sternum, which has been taken out of the way. These yellow guys coming down here are the phrenic nerves. There's one on the right hand side, which runs just over your sinus node, pretty much, and one on the left hand side. This is your left ventricle here, and all of those coronary venous tributaries from the coronary sinus run down the side here, and you're often trying to get your lead pretty much here. And it's quite easy to stimulate the phrenic nerve here. And you do that, and I'm sure you'll all have seen people who have phrenic nerve stimulation from CRT devices and left ventricular leads. And it's often very difficult to program around uh, to not get capture of the phrenic nerve, but to get capture of the left ventricle. Um, and it's pretty miserable for patients and can require reoperation or just us not being able to put a left ventricular lead in at all. Uh, then there's some more anatomical difficulties. Uh, so these are pictures of the ostium of the coronary sinus, so the way into the venous system from the right atrium. Mostly it's usually just a central hole that you can place catheters and leads down. But there are variety or there are variations on, on valves that are across the, the ostium that can progressively become more obstructive, meaning that you can't get into it or you can't pass a lead into it easily or sometimes at all. So there are difficulties with CRT. Um, there are alternatives though. Um, they've been around for maybe three or four years now. Um, they've gained a lot of press, which is quite exciting if you like that sort of stuff, but they also just work quite well, which is what I prefer. Um, so if we start off with his pacing, um, the concept isn't a particularly new one. Um, there was a, a chap who published this lovely little sketch diagram of the bundle of Hiss and the AV node back in 1978, and he proved you could do Hiss bundle pacing back then. And then everybody forgot about it because it seemed a bit hard um, until more recently when it's regained traction. Um, and the concept is this. So this is your AV node, your bundle of Hiss, and then branching off into left bundle, left posterior and anterior fascicle, and your right bundle. When we think of left bundle branch block, what most people have in their mind is that there's a lot of diseased conduction tissue down here somewhere. Whereas in fact, in almost everybody, all of the fibers that run down into the left bundle are predestined to go to the left bundle from right up here in the proximal hiss. And it turns out that where the 
block is, is right up here in the bundle of his. It's not down here in the ventricle. So if you imagine you've got conduction disease here, theoretically what you could do is place a pacing lead just here, capture all of these cables, and you'd have perfect conduction down into the ventricle and an entirely intrinsic QRS, which is the ultimate millions of years worth of evolution cardiac resynchronization. So if you put your lead here, you capture these guys, you're going to hit this area of block and you're still going to end up with a left bundle branch block down here. But if you put your lead here, capture the whole of the conduction tissue and end up with a narrow QRS that is identical to that of someone's intrinsic rhythm uh, before they developed left bundle branch block. Uh, which is beautiful and it, you get lovely paced ECGs that uh, look really attractive and you run around showing everybody them because you feel very proud of yourself. Uh, but there are some issues with it. Um, so for one, there are really complex thresholds that the physiologists have to mess around with because what you can do is you could put a lead just next door to this area of block. And you might say to me, oh, well, look, you've just said if you pace before the block, you still get left bundle branch block. But if you increase the output of the pacemaker, you capture a larger area of tissue. So if you increase the output really high, you capture this sort of area and you will overcome the left bundle branch block. And then as you decrease your output, you'll stop overcoming the left bundle branch block. If you decrease it more, you'll lose capture altogether. And so you have four or five different thresholds that the physiologists have to deal with when not only implanting, but also following up these pacemakers. And that leads to lots of problems if you don't work in a centre where you do complex devices, um, which a lot of centres are. People go back to their, their own pacemaker world in their own small hospital and, and have to be followed up there. And then this creates a lot of problems for those people. Uh, and there are odd things that you have to do with the programming to make them safe and effective um, that are unusual. People will see them and go, that's odd. We'll, we'll change that back to what is normal. And then you can run into problems, some, some of them quite bad. The implant is complex, so it's it's never going to turn into something that is done in every center that put they put pacemaker in, puts pacemakers in. Um, arguably, it's slightly more complex than doing traditional CRT which is more of an anatomical thing rather than needing to know about all of this carry on. You can have a problem where you have atrial oversensing. So the bundle of Hiss sits right between the atria and the ventricles. And what your lead can do is it can sense the electrical activity from the atria, which is just next door. And the device says, cool, I've seen an electrical impulse. I'm a ventricular lead. That means there's a ventricular depolarization. I won't do anything. But if it's seeing an atrial impulse and you've got complete heart block, there is no ventricular impulse and the lead is going to inappropriately not do anything, uh, which leads to asystole, which is bad. There's also rising pacing thresholds, so over time these things get worse is the long and the short of that. Um, and there's a question as if you pace here, what does later down in this person's life, they get some disease here, then you haven't solved the problem at all. You've just delayed the problem occurring until later. Uh, poor ventricular sensing, another issue with it. And tricuspid valve damage, um, the bundle of Hiss right between the atria and the ventricle is right on the line where the tricuspid valve is. And you can screw the lead directly through the tricuspid valve um, and you can pin it to the wall of the ventricle. Uh, you can cause problems to it during implant. Uh, so there's quite a lot of issues with his bundle pacing. This is the typical lead that we use for his and, and left bundle pacing actually. Uh, and this was one that I placed in the bundle of his. It, it didn't have very good electrical signals. So I thought, oh, well, I'll move it to somewhere else and took it out and it had this big long tail of stuff which is probably part of the tricuspid valve or a bit maybe perhaps a cord or 
something like that that should really still be in the heart. Um, and this is the sort of problems you can run into with his bundle pacing. So the the newest kid on the block, if you like, which has only really been done in the last couple of years, but this is the modality of CRT that I think will take off and become incredibly widespread over the next five, 10 years, uh, is left bundle pacing. So this is an unfolded left ventricle, if you like, where the conduction system, so the Hiss and Purkinje system has all been stained this lovely green colour. And you can see how diffuse it is. We think of it as there being a left anterior and a left posterior fascicle, but actually it's this broad swathe of conduction tissue going down. This is the sort of septal area here. So there's a large area that you could theoretically capture with a lead. And this large area means it's easier to put a lead in this particular place. A Hiss lead has to be in roughly the right tool. This stuff, you've got pretty much the entire septum or at least half the septum to aim for, uh, which makes it a lot easier. The uh, probably the easiest thing to start off looking at is this image on the right hand side. Uh, so to orientate you, you've got right atrium up here. Tricuspid valve running around here that's been pinned open for this model down here. Get the right ventricle. And then the right ventricular outflow tract, so the pulmonary artery up here. Bundle of Hiss sits in the very middle of the heart. And then the left bundle splays out down where these red lines are. Now, obviously, the left bundle is on the left hand side of the heart. And we're coming down here from a pacemaker through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So we need to get through to the left ventricle somehow. Um, so we have to tunnel our way through the septum, um, which we'll come to in just a second. So the first thing we do when we put these in is, is we inject a bunch of contrast into the right ventricle. So we have an outline of, of this anatomy here in a fluoroscopic kind of perspective. So you can see the tricuspid valve annulus around here. And we know the bundle of Hiss sits roughly at the top of that. And then you've got the outflow tract up here and the rest of the right ventricle down here. And what we've done here is this lead is sitting in the bundle of Hiss. So the tricuspid valve is sitting roughly here. And then if you imagine you just go a little bit further into the ventricle from the bundle of Hiss into that broad left bundle, all of those Purkinje fibers we saw before, you can put a lead in here. And you're far more likely to hit a bit of left bundle than you are to hit the very small Hiss bundle because of that large area. And in general, what you do is you go, well, look, this is where my bundle of Hiss is, which you know it's just sitting at the top of the tricuspid valve, you don't need to exact, know exactly where it is. And then you go a couple of centimetres down towards the apex of the heart, which is going to put you in sort of the, the proximal septum somewhere. And you screw this lead in and it's got a corkscrew at the end like most leads, but the corkscrew is exactly the same diameter as the, as the lead. And if you keep on screwing the lead in, the corkscrew keeps on pulling itself in through the septum and it will burrow its way through as long as you keep twisting it until you get to the other side. And if you keep going, it will go straight out and into the left ventricle. Now you don't want to go straight out through to the left ventricle, but if you stop just before you pop out the other side, then that's roughly where all of the left ventricular conduction tissue, the left bundle is sitting. And what you're looking at here is injecting some contrast through the sheath into the right ventricle. And a little bit like those images that the diagrams we saw initially, where you see left ventricle here, and then right ventricle sort of sitting around the outside. You can see the contrast coming down and hitting the septum here. And the lead has been tunneled through and the septum on the left ventricular side finishes about here. So the tip of the lead is right up against the left ventricular cavity, if you like. 
and the proximal part of the lead is just inside the septum. So it's crossing straight through the septum like that. And this is where we leave this lead and it allows us to capture the left bundle. Which gives us a very narrow QRS complex. The lovely thing about this is that it solves all of those problems we previously had with his bundle pacing. So there's no problems with um, sensing atrial signals. You're further away from the atria, so you can't see that. Um, it's far easier to put in. These things take, um, in fact, we just looked at all of the ones we did. They take about 60 to 70 minutes to put in on average for a dual chamber pacemaker, which is not far off what you do for a normal dual chamber pacemaker. So far quicker than CRT, definitely quicker than his bundle pacing. The leads are far more secure They're because really, they're buried in the septum that they're stuck in there. They're not dislodging, unlike left ventricular leads and uh, unlike his leads. You're in the middle of the septum. You're nowhere near the phrenic nerve. You're not going to capture the phrenic nerve at all. So they've got a lot of advantages to them. Um, and because they're capturing the conduction system directly, you get this very intrinsic natural looking QRS that is resynchronizing the heart uh, perfectly, really. Um, th this guy before we put a pacemaker in had a had a left bundle branch block with a QRS duration of about 190 something milliseconds. Um, screwed this guy in and, and pretty much instantaneously correct. Um, so I, I think because it's it's very easy to do, it's quick. Uh, there's only one lead in the ventricle as opposed to CRT where there's a couple of leads. They're far more expensive systems. This is cheap, simple. It's easy to follow up. These people can be followed up in any pacemaker clinic. You just treat them like a normal pacemaker. I think this is going to be the stuff that we start seeing a hell of a lot of, um, even in people for normal pacemakers, if you like, uh, not necessarily needing CRT over the next five to ten years or so. So questions? Anybody? Thank you, Matt. That was really interesting. Um, particularly, yes, that the, the, the information about the, the, the latest technology, extremely, um, yeah, sounds, sounds very exciting for the future. I do have a question, but I wonder if anybody else has got one to take off with. Perhaps if, I, perhaps if I could ask. Um, I was interested that you were saying that women tend to do better than men with CRT. And I wondered if you could explain why. So uh, I don't think we truly know why. Um, my suspicion is, is it's probably more due to the underlying cardiomyopathy in that uh, men are more likely to have ischemic cardiomyopathy because ischemic heart disease is more common in men. Uh, traditionally, men have smoked more and drunk more, um, which causes more myocardial fibrosis as well. Uh, women generally have more idiopathic cardiomyopathies, so there's no good reason. There's no scar in the ventricle. Um, and I think the, the sort of the female bias of women doing better and responding better is probably more due to the underlying condition. Um, there could well be and probably is some difference in how the heart functions based on hormonal aspects. So for example, we see tachyxubo cardiomyopathies uh, far more commonly in, in women than we do in men. Um, and that's not really due to co uh, comorbidities at all. There must be something in hormonal setup or some other aspects of, of how the heart is constructed and wired up that put women uh, at a greater risk of, of that particular cardiomyopathy. So it makes sense that there is some other factor that we just don't understand that means women have non-ischemic cardiomyopathies that respond better. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, yes, sorry, I may I just ask the left bundle um, pacing. So the tip of the lead 
Is it set in the septum or is going through septum? So the the lead is uh, going through the septum, but it doesn't perforate out into the uh, left. Ventricle. Okay. Uh, so sometimes, if you if you screw it too far, you will go into the left ventricular cavity, and you have to take it out and and try again. Um, if you do that, it doesn't really matter because the septum is this big muscular thing that mm -hmm. contracts out again. So although you've made this tiny hole the whole way through, a the hole's only about two or three millimeters wide, but it closes up instantaneously okay. afterwards. Okay. Uh, but Thank you're exactly you. right. If you did leave it hanging out in the left ventricle, then there'll be uh, a risk of thrombus forming on it yeah. and structure, things like that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I think if there's um if there's no other questions, um I'll just say a thank you, a very big thank you, Matt, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um and um well m m happy Christmas, which is just around the corner. Excellent. Thank you very much. And just, you know, if everybody does have any questions, feel feel free just to drop me an email uh, and I'll try and answer it as, as best as possible. Thank you. That's really, really kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much. See you guys. Bye. Uh, so we've now got, um, well, as, I mean, as much time as people want to spend discussing any other issues. Um, I, I did want to raise um, into hospital transfers again. And if anyone had had any success taking posters down to wards and uh, been able to talk to any ward staff about um, the importance of um, whoever is arranging the into hospital transfer, um, providing the correct information to the receiving, to the to the receiving hospitals. Um, so I don't know if we, if, if Stephen or Sarah or more than have got anything they want to sort of say anything from a, a tertiary centre along those lines. Hi, Sally Ann. Um, it's Steve here. Um, yeah, we've not had a well. We've, we've, it's 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 not very um, what's the word consistent, but uh, we have had some good um, quality referrals um, over the last couple of weeks. I'm trying to remember. So I'm not going to name names, but um, they'll probably know who they are. Um, but uh, it is quite um, inconsistent and uh, isolated the 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 quality of it. And I, I think what we're finding is that the um, the attachments that come with the referral are very often lacking um, and uh, I, I'm not sure how from the the non-tertiary centres how easy they find it to attach them but it's basically scan it and mm. add it on as a as a, a, a PDF or whatever on onto the the, the transfer uh, request. Um, very often we're finding that is it, it, we're we just asking the the centres to to just send the documents, whether they be echoes or ECGs or whatever, um, and we're loading it up um, onto onto um, the IHT. Um, that that's where we are at the moment. It's uh, you know there has been a, a breakthrough of sorts. Um, it's not widespread, but it's you know it's it's somewhere. But um, it, it's it's very appreciated when when it is a good quality referral and it just speeds up the transfer by you know several days, really. And I, and I think that, I think that's the issue, isn't it? It's it's about I mean when you say it speeds up the transfer by a couple of days, I think that's you know I mean that's so important from the patient's point of view from the the fact that we're desperate for beds at the moment yeah, um, yeah. Those, those seem to be key issues that we really need to hold on to and i mean i mean the bottom line the patient is is waiting longer um so i really think we need to, to carry on raising this as an issue um i can see that eleanor's here as well from king's i mean are you seeing any any improvement in um in the in the way that the iht is being used eleanor
perhaps Helen is not still here. Um, I've just seen a comment from Croydon. Um, also, Alice said we've shared the poster in Croydon, although we are not doing any many doing many transfers, um, but it's very useful for the staff. Yeah, that, that, thank you. That is really that's really helpful to and that's really useful to know that that Croydon have have, 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 have got that sort of communication going. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's Eleanor. It's Eleanor. I, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't have my headphones plugged in, so you couldn't hear me. Um, I think much the same as Stephen, really, that it is quite inconsistent still. Um, and to be honest, the last couple of weeks, we haven't been able to take very many transfers at all just because of COVID outbreaks and stuff here. So I think a lot of the trust do find it difficult to navigate the IHT system. It is just quite clunky and um, long winded to upload information to it. Um, what we tend to do is if we are taking referrals, we speak, we call, we ring the wards and speak to them. And if there is a lack of information, we get it emailed over to us. So we do still make sure that we see the ECGs and the echoes before we transfer anybody just to make sure it is completely um, appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's what all the receiving hospitals are doing. But it's just, just mm. as, you know, a, it's it's not only time consuming for you. It's the fact mm. that it's the patients, it the, the 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 patient is having their treatment delayed, mm. and, um, and, and and essentially that's a bed that you know is being used for potentially longer, which may mm. not be necessary. Um, actually, Shay has also said from Kingston, the host, the poster was shared and discussed at the governance meeting. So, I mean, it sounds like there has been that. That's so helpful to hear from the referring hospitals, um, and it does sound like there has been a slight improvement. So, I think that that's really encouraging. Um, I had met with with Stephen and um, Sarah from GSTT to talk about what whether we might do a sort of a monthly um, or possibly monthly, possibly fortnightly. We'll see what we think is sensible. Um, meet between the receiving hospitals to look at sort of referrals and just again to keep the keep the the, the conversation going um, around the importance of getting um, the IH, IHT patients flowing. Um, I, do, I also said I would I would do a I'd do a get, get a list of um, matrons probably the matrons for each of the wards that potentially would be having patients that were being referred. So if there are cardiology wards or medical wards or the CCU. Um, I have to say, Stephen and Sarah, I've not had any response back yet about any of those people, but I will I will chase them. Obviously, I recognise at the moment it's an, ex it's an extremely challenging and busy time for everybody at the moment, um, but we'll, we'll work on that and we can then share that with the receiving hospitals. Um, the training, just again, so you've got a, you know, a clear contact person to, to contact. That would be that really would helpful, be helpful actually, if that's um if that's at all possible just a point of contact just makes life you know and obviously they're not gonna be there 24 7 but mm. uh, at least you know on a, the majority of occasions if there is somebody to liaise with it really it really helps it really yeah. helps yeah yeah i mean, also, I, mean I, man, I, I i emailed all the service managers across all of the south london trusts and, and we could do the same with um with uh the north london services as well, which which would also impact on the Bronson and Harefield. Um, and I haven't had any response, but I, I will I will continue to chase on that. But it, it sounds like actually we're moving in the right direction, which is really, really encouraging. Um, anything else that anyone wants to raise around into hospital transfers? Is there anything else that anyone wants to share with colleagues or get you know, ideas or thoughts? I don't know if people want to do introductions again. I mean, would it be helpful to do everyone to introduce themselves again? I know there are some people here who have been on previous um, calls. Would that be helpful to do introductions again? The, the silence is deafening. It is. I don't know whether that's people think it's a good idea or not a good idea. If people, if, if anyone thinks it's a good idea to just do a quick introduction round again, just say yes. I'm happy to. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, thank you. I can see that Ali is typing again from from Croydon. I know sometimes people haven't got um 
dot mics as well, which makes it a bit more complicated. OK, so let's just do a quick round of introductions. I'll just go around the screen as, as actually I'll go around the list. Actually, that's a bit easier. Um, right, Ida, can you would you would you mind starting? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm Ida, one of the arrhythmia nurses from Herfield Hospital. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I'm also one of the arrhythmia nurses at Harefield Hospital. Uh, Sarah. Sarah, is that, is that Sarah at St Thomas's? Yes. Yeah, she's actually out uh, with a patient at the moment. She's had to uh, to disappear. OK, thank you. Uh, Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki Hi. from Arrhythmia Nurse from Kingston Hospital. Oh, there's two Nickies. Gosh, oh, sorry. <laughs> you were the Nikki Howell, yes. <laughs> and then there's Nikki Nikki Margiersen. Yeah, hi, I'm Nikki. I've also got Annabelle with me this afternoon with the device nurses um, at Harefield. Uh, Eleanor. Hi, so I'm um, Eleanor. I'm the Ridley nurse at Kings, and this is Richard. Um, also with me and us. We do have a third member of our team as well, Sophie Hunt, who um, used to be one of the cardiology, cardiothoracic nurses at um, King's, but she's on leave at the moment, but there are three of us now. Thank you. Shea. Hi, um, I'm one of the arrhythmia nurses at Kingston Hospital. Um, who's next? Stephen? Hi, I'm Steve Walker. I uh, work in uh, I'm one of the arrhythmia nurses at St Thomas's. Um, I work with, as mentioned before, with Sarah, who's not here, and also Morven, who I'm sure um, will speak shortly. Yep, oh, Morven. Hello, I'm Morven. <laughs> I work with Steve and Sarah at St Thomas's. I'm one of the EP nurses. Thank you. And um, Ali um, Ravid, Ravindran from Croydon um, hasn't got a speak or hasn't got a, a mic, um, but um, has introduced herself in the in the chat. So thank you. Um, anything that anyone wants to say, bounce off a colleague, query, need help, anything that people want to raise? One thing I was going to was going to potentially going to share um, last week, the team that I work in, so the the cardiovascular network teams for South London, um, we had an away day and one of the items that we wanted to do was to look at um, CPR training. So we'd had a really interesting talk from um, one of the ICC consultants uh, a month previously um, talking about sudden sudden death sudden cardiac death and so we, we we hired some kit from the or didn't hire we borrowed some kit from the British Heart Foundation um, and then Morven came and joined us and one of the ACS nurses um, and it was it was excellent um, so it was just a big thank you to Morven it was really really helpful to have um, you know a, somebody there with us who'd had lots of experience for both in hospital and out of hospital cardiac arrest um, and we I think we all the whole team so there was about nine of us or ten of us present um, you know, as as, you know, as, as lay non-clinical people, it was very useful to come away feeling that actually, should somebody collapse in front of us, actually we we we, we knew what to do and we practiced on the dummies. Um, and of course, it won't it will come of no surprise to 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 you all that it was incredibly hard work. I don't think any of us quite appreciated, um, you know, how how tiring it is doing um, compressions. But I mean, as more than said, you know. Uh, we we all knew we'd be flooded with adrenaline, and therefore it would obviously be you know you you you'd have that strength to keep going. But um, but I I think if I think the reason I'm raising it here is that I think if anybody is is kind of you know if if you're if you're in contact with a management team or an operational team or you know an admin team, um, it might just be worth raising. You know, do people know what to do? You know, if, in in the case of a, of, a, of an out of hospital arrest. Um, and one of the one of the facts that was shared with us um, on the video that the British Heart Foundation also supplied was that in this country, less than one in 10 people will survive an out of hospital arrest. 
Whereas I think it was in Finland or Denmark where CPR is taught in schools on a regular basis, it's something like four out of 10 will survive an out of hospital arrest, which is you know, quite a dramatic change. So, um, so we all felt it was an extremely you know, useful skill to have, to have had the opportunity to have a go at practicing. And I say having, having somebody's input, you know, uh, 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 more than's input and Ian's input was, was really helpful. I, I, um, I said to Steve and Sally Ann that if anyone has kids that are like teenagers, go to youth clubs, stuff like that, they can get the same resources mm -hmm. you have. Um, and you can easily do that with a youth group of teenagers that are more than able to resuscitate someone. So really good thing to do. Yeah, no, actually, that, that's a really, really good point. So whilst we really benefited from having you and Ian there, you know, it was the, the, the video was excellent. You know, the resource was excellent. And it was it was incredibly straightforward to follow what we needed to do. And it is the bottom line is it's quite straightforward. But I think just having having done it on a on a on a, a mannequin, you do feel a bit more confident. Eleanor, you were going to say something. Yeah, I just wondered if it was entirely down to the education or is it or do they also have more access to ADs in the community in those countries that you were, you were mentioning? Because I know here sometimes even when there are there is an AD locally, the codes aren't always available or they're not um, easily accessible. So that does also cut down the survival rate. Yeah, no, yeah, good point. I, I, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, the, the point they were making was about the, it was that it was about the education. Um, mm -hmm. But as you say, access to defibrillators may also make a make a big difference. Mm. If we meet again in say three months, what would people like to cover? So again, I think I think having the the educational input is is so valuable. Um, what another what what topics would people like to cover? You'll have to tell me because I don't know. <laughs> I think Ali's just mentioned uh, cardio versions, which is probably a good one that we can all talk about, compare and uh, contrast. Oh, that's yeah. Experiences, really yeah. I guess. Yeah. Is cardio version. So, so actually, so would that be worth then all of you preparing to talk to say something about how you do it in your site on your on your in on your site or what what might that discussion look like yeah i think that would be really helpful because we're with the apollo program as well um i think they're starting to try and link all the sites together and um make it a bit more of a coherent service so it's true it'd actually, probably be yeah. really interesting for us to actually learn what each other do I think probably 90 percent of the time, it, 90 percent of the time, it's probably going to be exactly the same. But it's those little differences that kind of, mm. you know, yeah. little little tweaks that you can do mm. to your to your service. So that might that might yeah. prove useful, actually. Yeah. Okay. So if I if I perhaps touch base with one of you and sort of put together kind of a rough sort of template kind of thing to sort of suggest what aspects you covered so everyone sort of had a similar sort of template to, 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 to present on would that be quite helpful so that it would be really easy to compare the differences and the similarities I can see some nods would anybody like to volunteer to, to work with me on that Yeah. Volunteer, that, volunteering. Are you volunteering? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know how busy everybody is. If there's nothing else that anyone wants to raise or ask their colleagues, we can all have half an hour back, which I'm sure everybody will find really useful. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you all very much for joining. Um, I hope that in the run up to Christmas, things don't get too manic at work. And I hope you can all have a lovely Christmas and a lovely bit of a break. And I'll see you all next year. See you all next thank year. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Bye. Christmas, Merry, Christmas, Merry Christmas, everyone. Good Merry luck. Merry, Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas. Bye. <laughs> it's going to be hell. <laughs> Uh...